Hi, welcome. So we're in the RStudio environment, and we've ran all the code through the end of video three, where we concluded with uh, a nice document frequency matrix, a representation of our textual data in terms that R can understand. So as promised, we're going to go ahead and build our first model. So we're going to follow best practices in building our model, and we're going to leverage cross-validation as the basis for our model building process. Cross-validation is a technique by which we get maximum use of our training data, and it also allows us to create, ideally, representative estimates of what our model will do in production on brand new data that it's never seen before. And we do cross-validation to, um, as part of our process, to understand how well are our features going to perform. How well will the model that we use perform? How well will the model parameters that we're using perform? So on and so forth. So cross-validation is extremely central to our machine learning process. It is basically um, our workflow for determining, are we building a model that's going to be any good? OK, and if you're not familiar with cross-validation, here's a link in the code to a wiki page uh, on the Wikipedia website where you can find out more information about cross-validation. Okay, so to be able to perform cross-validation, we're going to need two things. We're going to need our features that we've created, right? We're going to need our document frequency matrix, or document feature matrix, as Quantita calls it. Essentially, this is our representation where each row is a document, and each column is essentially a token, a term, and the count of how often that particular term, that particular token, shows up in any given document in our corpus. And once again, a corpus is just the fancy term for the collection of documents. And in this case, for us, it is a collection of SMS text messages. Okay, so the data frame function, actually that should be as data frame. So the as data frame function will transform a quantita DFM representation into a plain old standard R data frame. And so this is, this is the first part of the equation that we need, right? These are our features, right? This is our representation of our textual documents in a way that R can understand. Next up, we're going to need to marry that with our labels because we're trying to predict ham or spam. That's the whole idea, right? We want to build a model that can accurately detect whether an SMS text message is ham, legit, or spam, illegit. So for a feedback mechanism to train the machine learning algorithm, we have to have the label. So we can use the cbind function and bind these two things together, and we'll call the resulting data frame that we'll create train.tokens.df. So if I run this line of code, it takes a second to run, but sure enough, if I expand this out over here, you can see here that I have my train.tokens.df, which is 3,901 observations, right? Good, that's the number of texts that we know are in our training set. And now we have 5,744 variables. Cool, right? Before we had 5,743, now we have 5,744 because we've added the label. Great. So now we have a good training set. So now here's the thing. You would think that normally we'd be ready to go and start building some machine learning models, but often that's not the case. As I mentioned before, um, working with data and manipulating data and pre-processing data and wrangling data is part and parcel of machine learning in general, but it's even more important in text analytics because, quite frankly, text, text data tends to be quite dirty. So we're going to have an example of that. So if we said, okay, hey, Let's just take a look at the names of this data frame that we've created. Right? The names of this data frame will be basically the terms, the individual tokens that we parsed out as part of our tokenization process. And in particular, I'm going to pick out four here. And this is not at random, obviously. I have a nefarious purpose here. I want to illustrate something. So this says, OK, get all the names from the data frame, but I actually only want to look at these four. So if I run these, you can see the names that we get. 8 a.m., second, for text, and try colon wall. So that's going to be, this is going to be a problem. This is going to be a problem because, quite frankly, these are not 
actually valid names for columns and data frames, strictly speaking. So if we use certain types of machine learning algorithms in our work, they're going to error. They're going to throw an error and say, I don't understand the name of this thing. 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 So we need to fix these up. We need, to, we need to make these, we need to coerce them, we need to transform these names into something that essentially are legitimate column names universally across the board. Every machine learning algorithm in the world, uh, excuse me, not every machine learning algorithm in the world, every machine learning function in the R world, that's what I wanted to say, uh, will recognize the names of these columns. And lucky for us, there's actually a function called make names. So that's worthy of taking a look at the help file make syntactically valid names. So this function implements some rules and processes for going through a whole collection of strings and saying, look, is this actually a syntactically valid R name or not? And if it's not, it'll fix it up. It'll fix it for us. So instead of having to go through all these by hand and figuring out which one, which one, one of these columns and out of the 5,744 know, 5, that we have, do we need to fix, we can actually just automate this process using the make names function. So I call make names, I feed it the names of my data frame, it fixes them all up, I then ask R to overwrite the existing names with the corrected names, and then we should be good to go. So I'll run that line of code, sweet. Okay, now we're ready, our data is prepped, and now we can build, we can train our first model. So here's the thing. Uh, we're going to use stratified cross-validation. And the reason why we have to do that is because we have class imbalance in our data. Right? Spam, while not exceedingly rare, spam is actually um, quite less prevalent in our data set than, it was, than, than ham is. So that we have a class imbalance problem. So we want to make sure that as we do our cross-validation, which involves random sampling, that each sample that we take is representative in terms of the proportions of ham and spam. That's known as stratified sampling. So specifically what we're going to do is we're going to implement stratified folds for tenfold cross-validation, which we're going to repeat three times. So what this code will do here is actually create for us 30 random stratified samples because we're going to do tenfold cross-validation repeated three times. Now. You may be asking, if you know about cross-validation, Dave, hey, I get the tenfold part. That's totally cool. I, I grok that. Why am I doing it three times? And the answer is, is because if we can take the computational hit, if we're willing to take the time and effort to actually run cross-validation multiple times, we will actually get more valid estimates. We'll get more looks at the data, therefore our estimation process will be more robust. So we're going to do three. Uh, we're going to do tenfold cross validation repeated three times with stratified samples. I also like to use repeated cross validation when I can, um, especially when I have some class imbalance because you just never know with class imbalance how that's going to work out. So this is this is a reasonable strategy to take, assuming that you're willing to take the computational hit. And we'll see later uh, in the code. Uh, I'm going to do a few things to actually make this a little bit of a less of a burden for us. Um, and even later on in the in the series, we'll actually reduce the size of our data down using feature extraction so that we can keep running these cross validation, um, these repeated cross validation um, processes with more and more complex models without us, you know, having to wait like hours and hours and hours and hours for these models to train. Okay. So first up, we're going to use the create multifolds function. And this is a cool function from the caret package. So let's go ahead and look it up. So it's one of the data splitting functions. And what create multifolds does is essentially is allows you to create uh, multiple stratified random samples. So basically create multifolds is a wrapper around the create data partition function. The create data partition function is the basic function in, in caret that allows you for creating stratified random samples. Multifolds just says, look, you know what? Just create me a bunch of folds. A bunch of folds. So we have to tell it, okay, fine. I want you to create multifolds for me, caret. 
here is the class label that I want you to use. It needs the class label, it needs this factor variable so that it can actually calculate what the proper proportions sh should be in each of the random samples, in each of the folds. And then we also have to tell it essentially how many folds we want. We say, okay, look, I'm gonna be doing 10 fold cross validation and uh, by convention, this is referred to as K, K fold cross validation and the K is 10, We're doing 10 fold cross validation. And we tell it how many times we wanna repeat the process. We wanna repeat a process three times. And so it'll say, okay, three times 10 is 30. I will create you 30 random samples where they are stratified. Each of the random samples will be proportional. It will be proportional in terms of the, the label distribution. Okay, cool. So next up, we have to then tell Carrot, cool, how do I actually want to start processing um, my training? How do I want to do my training process? So this creates my folds. This doesn't this, this just gives me the way to actually set up my data for the training, but it doesn't specify the process by which Carrot will execute the training. That's what this call does here, train control. So this one's also worthy of a lookup. Okay, train control. This is, I'm not gonna drain this help file. There's a lot of stuff in here, but notice that what this should tell you is, yeah, it's a big complicated function, but there's also a lot of power here. Carrot gives you a lot of fine-grained control regarding your machine learning model uh, building process. So we're going to use an actually relatively simple setup. Hey, Carrot, we want you to build our models using a repeated CV, repeated cross-validation process, where the number of folds is 10, the repeats is equal to 3. Now, you could just leave the code right here. You could just drop a, a, a closing parenthesis right here, leave this part out, and you'd be good to go. And Carrot would be off to the races and happy to and train you a model. But since we want stratified cross-validation, we need to specify the actual folds. Because if you don't specify this, by default, you're not going to get stratified cross-validation. So this is the mechanism by which we can say, okay, Carrot, look, I've already pre-calculated all of the folds that I want you to use for the 10-fold cross-validation repeated three times. Please use these folds. And it'll say, okay, cool. And since we've built them to be stratified, we know we're good to go. So I'll go ahead and run this, and we're setting the seed, obviously, to make sure that you see at home what you see on the video. Okay, so cool. We've got our process set up. We're gonna do 10-fold cross-validation repeated three times, and each fold is stratified, meaning that the proportion of the labels will be the same. Great. So here's the first trick that we're going to do. As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, I reserve the right to add packages to the mix. I am going to go ahead and do so right now. I'm adding a package to the mix. In particular, I'm adding the do snow package. So do snow is a package that you can use to uh, run training in Carrot in parallel. So that's the first thing that we're going to do to speed up our cross validation runs, which is we're going to train them in parallel. So for example, we have 30, we have 30 folds. So if I, had, if I had a big enough machine that had 30 cores, 30 CPUs in it, I could actually train each fold all at once. I have 30 cores, I assign each fold to one of my cores on my computer, and I'm off and running. Now a 30 core machine is, is a very, very big machine. So most people aren't gonna have access to that, but you get the idea, right? If you have, if you have a machine that has multiple cores, or is hyper-threaded so that, for example, if it has two cores, but it, it actually can run four threads simultaneously, sweet. This will make your, your cross-validation go faster because essentially you get linear scale out. If I have four cores instead of one core, I should be done in about a quarter of the time that it would take me to use only one CPU. And that, that works out to be about, about right. So we're gonna train in parallel. I like using do snow. There are other packages you can use to do this, but I like using Do Snow because Do Snow works on both uh, Windows and Macintosh, and Linux, I would assume as well, although I haven't tested it, um, out of the box. So I use Do Snow. So we're gonna load up the Do Snow package. And for Grinzies, I'm gonna go ahead and um, time the execution of this code, just so that you can see it. 
Now, here's something that's super important. Notice I put this in the comments, the warning here. Uh, the code by default when you get it from the GitHub is set up for a workstation or a server class machine. Specifically, it is set up to run on 10 cores, 10 logical cores. Now, as I record this video, I'm running on a laptop that is far, far less powerful than that. So I'm going to change this number to three because my, my laptop is a dual core hyper-threaded, so it has four logical cores. I need to keep at least one core for the operating system. So I'm gonna only get three cores out of this. Now, as you might imagine, this is gonna run for a while. So what I will do is we will step away from the video for a while and let this thing run. And then we'll, we'll resume back up after it's executed and you can see how long it takes to run on my laptop. Now, just for, for preview of coming attractions, when I ran this on my workstation with 10, 10 threads with 10 cores, it only took about four minutes. Now it's gonna take approximately three times longer than that um, to run on my just my laptop here. So it should take 12 or so minutes, but we'll see for sure. But before I execute that code, let's go ahead and just walk through everything that we're going to do. So this first line of code is, is just a poor man's way of just doing um, performance testing. I'm asking, I'm asking R to give me the current system time and I store that so that later on I can find the difference between when I started and when I ended and that gives me my elapsed processing time. Now what we're really interested in is these two lines of code here. Make cluster and register do snow. So this first function right here actually creates a do snow cluster for doing work in parallel. And the type that we're requesting is a socket cluster. Now if you're not familiar with sockets and clusters and that sort of thing, it's okay. The easiest way to think about this and the most intuitive way to think about this is make cluster effectively creates in the background on your computer multiple instances of RStudio. It's not 100% correct, but it's close enough for our purposes. It creates multiple instances of RStudio and then allows Carrot to borrow those instances of RStudio and use them all at once to do its processing. That's effectively what this does. So I'm saying, okay, look, spin up behind the scenes three instances of our studio and make those available to Carrot to use if it would like to. That's what this does, right? And I've, the, the higher this number goes, the more our studio instances are created behind the scenes and the more CPU that I will use. Just so that you're aware, um, this setting right here will make my, my laptop run at about 96% CPU. <laughs> so be really, really careful with how you set this. Okay, after the cluster is made, I then ask the do snow package to actually register the cluster. Now this is super, super important. This line of code actually alerts Carrot that these instances of our studio are available for it to use if it so chooses. This is not enough. Just building the cluster is not enough. You actually have to register it and then once it's registered, Carrot will recognize it and say, oh, okay, you want me to train in parallel. Cool, I can totally do that. And that's what'll happen, okay. So next up, we're going to use the train function. Now this is also worthy of a lookup in the help file. So the train function in Carrot is awesome. It has tons of goodness in here. It allows you, this is the main function that actually builds your model. So I won't drain the help file, I'll just parse what we've got going on here. So first up, notice that there's this method variable, or this method parameter, excuse me, on the train function. This tells train what kind of machine learning model that I would like to build. So right now I'm going to use an R part algorithm, but I could quickly change it to a random forest. Or I can make it an XGBoost decision tree. This is the power of caret, is that it's highly configurable. Uh, all things being equal, with very few minor exceptions, it's very, very simple for me to build up a, a pipeline in Carrot and just swap out the model, the algorithm that I would like to use by just changing this string value. Okay, cool. So the reason why we're using our part trees is because an R part is a single decision tree. So I said there was a couple things that we were going to do to speed up our cross-validation processing here in the beginning of the video series. One is we're training in parallel, always a good idea when you can do it. And two, 
we're going to use single decision trees because single decision trees actually train relatively fast. A random forest is actually, not surprisingly, a collection of trees. So random forest would take a lot longer for us to train. And given that our data is actually relatively, you know, it's, it's not big data, quote unquote, but it's non-trivial in size. It's 3,901 rows of over 5,700 columns. That's, that's, that's not, that's no data to sneeze at, as it were. So we're going to try and speed this up by using a simpler algorithm just to kind of give you some intuition of what we're going to be doing over the course of the series here. Okay, so we're going to be using single decision trees, R part trees. This function, excuse me, this formula, my apologies, this formula says, look, predict label, predict label, and predict it by all the rest of the data in the data set. That's what this dot means. Predict label by all the rest of the data. And the data is stored, not surprisingly, in the data frame that we created, which is in the rest of the data, this dot, is essentially is our term frequencies for all of our documents. That's our feature set. We then also tell the train function, hey, here's the train control. This is the process I want you to follow. Notice how cleanly separated the process of doing your training is from the actual model because those two are separate, right? I define my cross-validation parameters and my data totally separately and independently of the algorithm I'm using. Cross-validation works exactly the same for random forests and decision trees as it does for uh, logistic regression as well as artificial neural networks. So they're, they're abstracted from each other in Caret. Okay, so that's our train control. And then lastly, this, this, out, this uh, parameter right here tells the train function to say, look, you know what? Please try seven, seven different values, seven different configurations of the R part algorithm. Try seven different ways to configure R part and find out which one of those seven configurations works the best, and that's the one I want you to use, which is pretty nice. This is known as hyperparameter tuning. So this automatically tries seven different values for a hyperparameter for the R part algorithm and finds which of those seven values works the best on the data and lets you know what that is and builds you a model using that. Cool. Lastly, once we're done training, we need to stop the cluster because we're done using those R Studio instances behind the scenes. So we might as well you know, exit out of R Studio and free up the resources on the computer because it's a waste. So stop cluster, then do that. And then lastly, um, I calculate the total execution time, and we can take a look at our cross-validation results. So now I'm going to go ahead and highlight all of this code and run it at once. And then we will pause the video, and we will cut out the video, and then we'll resume back when um, the processing is done. And we can see how much more slowly this ran on my laptop than it did on my workstation, and that'll give you some approximate um, idea of um, how long this may take on your computer. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and run this code and we'll come back once the code is done executing. Okay, we're back. Surprisingly enough, my little laptop here actually ran all of the code here, ran all of the iterations of the cross-validation in parallel only using three logical cores in a little over seven minutes which is not bad because my big beefy workstation took four minutes to do it. So that's not exactly what I expected. But anyway, you get the idea, right? Doing this work in parallel is a good idea because even on my laptop, this would have taken quite a bit longer if I only used a single core. Okay, so let's take a look at, if I run this line of code, I'll get this output that we'll see scrolling up here and I'll just go through it step by step. Okay. So what we've got going on here is the output from Carrot, and it tells us a lot of, lot of good things. So first up, what it tells us is, okay, Dave, what did you actually do? Well, I ran cart. I ran a cart tree. And it talks about I had 3,901 rows, and I had 5,743 features, and I had two classes. I had ham and spam. And then it talks about... Uh, the process. It said, Dave, you didn't do any pre-processing, which we didn't because our data was okay. And here's the resampling method used. We used cross-validation, specifically tenfold, repeated three times, and it gives us a summary of the various sample sizes used. Notice that they're all about the same. Okay. Now notice the next step, there are seven 
distinct entries here, all right? Seven distinct entries for the CP parameter. I won't go into what the CP parameter is. Just know that it is a, a knob, a dial, that you can turn up or down and adjust how the card algorithm works. And different levels of this particular value are gonna give you different results. So for example, if it's set at 0.325, my average accuracy on my tenfold cross-validation repeated three times was around 88%. But notice that carrot actually tells you what the best value of the seven actually was. It says, look, you had the best accuracy, you had the optimal model, when the CP value was at 0 0.0210325, which is this right here. And notice that we're at 94.3-ish percent accuracy. Well, that's not too bad, right? Right out of the box. Just a very simple representation, just a very, very light cleaning of our data. The simplest text analytics data pre-processing pipeline you can think of, we did and we got 94.3% accuracy, which is not too bad. Now in future videos, we will see how we can improve this in a couple of different ways. One is, uh, in the next video, we will use the mighty TFIDF, the mighty term frequency inverse document frequency to push this accuracy up a little bit by transforming the nature of the data that we have. Uh, after that, we'll then take a look at adding what are known as n-grams, uh, which will add more features to our, to our model. And we'll see how that will affect our performance going forward. Uh, ideally, it will improve it, we'll have to see. And then after that, we will do feature extraction and uh, we'll do singular value decomposition, which will actually take all of this ever exploding number of columns that we have and shrink them down to try to find the underlying uh, patterns of behavior amongst the, the, uh, the terms in our text messages that actually did actually most closely identify ham versus spam. And then lastly, we'll do some feature engineering uh, using text lengths and uh, some similarity some similarity scores <clears throat> and that'll end our feature engineering and at that point we'll shift over from saying okay look this is the set of features that I have can I use better algorithms and that's when we'll move into the mighty random forest and see if the mighty random forest will actually improve our overall performance over using single trees and that'll conclude the series okay so this is a good point to end thank you for watching if you have any questions at all please, please, please use the comments section. We at Data Science Dojo monitor the channel on a re regular basis and we try to answer any and all questions. Also, if you like what you're doing, if we're doing here, if you like the tutorials, please subscribe to the channel. We'll be producing content on a weekly basis and hopefully we can produce more things that you will find useful in your daily work. And lastly, I hope to see you in an upcoming Data Science Dojo Bootcamp. Until next time, this is Dave Langer and I wish you very happy data sleuthing.